One of the main purposes of a lens is to collect more light than your eye would ordinarily gather. If we imagine a point source far away, only a small number of light rays from it will actually hit your pupil. These are the blue rays in the figure below. While nearby rays, the red ones, will go above or below your eyes. If we used refraction to bend some rays back down towards your eye, we could put prisms here and redirect this light. The problem is this light that takes the red path is there, there has to go a longer distance and it's being slowed down by the glass. So what we'll get there significantly after the light that takes the straight path. We don't have any way to speed up the light that takes the long path, but we can slow down the light that takes the shorter path. We can slow it down by putting glass in its way. We want it to be flat on the sides so that we don't bend it, so it's essentially a window here in the center. We look at this and we see, okay, there's also going to be some rays in the middle here that have to be both slowed a little bit and bent a little bit. And if we do the math for what shape of lens will do this, we get the converging lens. Notice that this, it's converging because it's bringing this light that's spreading out back down to a point. It's also convex while converging mirrors are concave. If we assume that we're making these lenses by cutting sections out of spheres again, we find a lot of similarities with the mirrors. We again have a focal length, and that's the point where the lens will bring parallel light to a focus. If we have a converging lens, it'll have a positive focal length, and the diverging lens, shown here, will have a negative focal length. If we send parallel light through this diverging lens, we see, of course, it spreads out. That's what diverging means your brain will track back along these lines and say that the light all came from a point right about here, which is your focal length. If we redo this, the examples we did with mirrors, we're going to get the same results with lenses. To start, let's say we have a converging lens with a focal length of plus 0.5 meters. That's how we know it's convex, because it's a positive focal length. We put an object 1.5 meters away, and we see that the image forms at a location determined by the thin lens equation. We do the math, and we get 0.75 meters. The fact that that's positive tells us this is a real image. Magnification, we use the same formula as before. We get negative 0.5. The negative sign tells us the image is upside down compared to the object, and the absolute value being less than 1 tells us the image is smaller than the object. There is one difference for a lens compared to a mirror, and that is a virtual image is on the same side of the lens as the object. As we start moving in closer, we watch for things to change. Change the object distance to 0.75 meters. The image distance is now 1.5 meters, so our magnification becomes negative 2. The image is real, inverted, and larger than the object. We move in to one focal length away so that the object distance is 0.5 meters, DI goes to infinity, so there is no image, meaning parallel light leaves the lens, and this is another good design for a flashlight. We continue to get closer. The object distance is now 0.25 meters, which is inside the focal length. DI is negative 0.5 meters, so it's a virtual image. Magnification is plus 2, so that tells us it's larger than the object and upright. The light, from the, the light from the object is spreading out so much that the converging lens can't bring it back down to a point, and it's still spreading when it leaves the lens, just not as fast as it would have spread without the lens. You can see here this closer-in pencil. This is the object. Back here, this is the image. You see that the light's spreading out very dramatically from the object. It gets bent back towards the axis here, but not enough to completely bend it back and form a focal point over here. Instead, your eye traces back along these white lines, back along the green too, and we get to this virtual image. This is what your eye sees, and of course, as our math showed, this is bigger than the object, it's in the same orientation, and it's further from the lens. This is a screen capture from a FET that you'll do later. If we repeat this process with a diverging lens, we have f equals negative 0.5 meters. We start with an object 1.5 meter, meters away. We get an image distance of negative 0.375 meters, magnification of plus 0.25. The image is virtual, upright, and smaller than the object. We start moving closer in. 
object distance changes to 0.75, image distance to negative 0.3, magnification to plus 0.4. We have a virtual image still upright and smaller than the object. As we keep moving closer, the numbers change, but we continue to have virtual images that are upright and smaller than the object. Here at 0.5 meters, our image distance is negative 0.25 meters, magnification plus 0.5. And finally, at 0.25 meters, our image distance is negative 0.1667, and our magnification is positive two-thirds. This image is still virtual, upright, and smaller than the object, and we never saw an image flip here. This is the same thing that happened with the diverging mirror. All of our Im images will be virtual if we just have a single diverging lens. There are a couple of things that I haven't told you yet about this. First of all, when I said we wanted a shape such that all the light from different points would focus at the same point, that doesn't really happen with the sphere. With the sphere, the light that's further from the center of the lens comes to a focus closer to the lens, and the light that's closer to the center here comes to a focus further away. This is because a sphere is not really the right mathematical shape for this to work, using the law of reflection as we know it what we really need is a paraboloid and the reason we use this is because spheres are much easier to make. It's much easier to make a mirror with a spherical cross-section than a parabolic cross-section. The result though, this blurring of the focal spot is called spherical aberration. Mirrors have it and these spherical lenses we've talked about will also have spherical aberration. There's a different problem that we have just in lenses. We go back and look at our original lens drawing and we see if we did put prisms up here, yes, we'd get light bending down like that, but we'd also get light spreading out because of dispersion. Each color of light sees a different focal length for the lens. The way we can make this more obvious is to look at the what's called the lens maker's equation. This is if you wanted to start designing these things. This is what you'd need to know. The focal length is related to this ratio of index of refraction of the glass or plastic or whatever divided by index of refraction of the medium. Usually for us this is air, so N1 is essentially 1. And then this difference in the reciprocals of the curvatures. Notice that for a symmetric lens we don't have R1 equals R2 because then this would be 0 and we'd get the conclusion that F must be infinite. R1 will be the negative of R2 for a symmetric lens, and you'll use this in your FET lab. You may have also heard eyeglass companies talk about high index lenses, and what this means is plastics that have higher values of this N than ordinary. That gives you a stronger lens, which is shorter focal length, without it having to be Coke bottle thick. This uh, equation also tells us how things would change if we took our lens and dropped it in water so that now N1 is more like 1.33 than 1. The fact that the focal length depends on wavelength is what gives us chromatic aberration. This is something that again we have to co correct for if we're building fine optical equipment. This only happens for lenses and not mirrors because mirrors work on the law of reflection rather than the law of refraction and there's no index of refraction for mirrors. When we look at interesting optical systems, we can first look at your eye. If you have perfect vision, light from far away, which doesn't spread much and is practically parallel, comes to a focus on your retina, as well as light from nearby, which is spreading much more. If you're farsighted, the lens in your eye can focus that distant light easily, but it's too weak to get the nearby rapidly spreading light focused by the time it reaches your retina. What you need is a converging lens in front of your eye to give it a boost. The lenses aren't really specified by focal length for eyeglasses, and the reason is it's not a very intuitive system. Larger focal length is a less powerful lens. So using eye, in the eyeglass world, they use optical power, which is the reciprocal of focal length. And the unit of that is called the diopter, where one diopter is a focal length of one meter. If you're farsighted, you'll have a prescription, something like plus one, plus two, plus three. This happens to your eyes naturally as you age, and if you're in a pharmacy sometime, there's usually a rack of reading glasses that have numbers like this printed on them, and larger numbers are stronger. 
Here's a picture of what happens to a far-sighted eye. You can focus the light to a point, but it would only happen behind your retina. It's still a blur here. If you're nearsighted, what's really happening is the lens system in your eye is too strong. The things that are close to you and are diverging a lot, you could focus those on your retina, but the things that are far away from you, and there's not much divergence there, there this is parallel light coming in, that will focus too soon, and since there's nothing there, it spreads back out by the time it hits your retina, and it's also a blur. So what you need here is something to make the light spread out a little more. You need a diverging lens. This means if you're nearsighted, your prescription will be something like negative 1 or negative 2.5, something like that. For some reason, you won't find these on the rack in the pharmacy. These are only prescription. Farsightedness glasses, yes, you can buy those without a prescription for some reason, but not if you're nearsighted. We can also look at multi-lens systems. In real life, you'd want to do this with ray tracing because one of the reasons why expensive SLR camera lenses cost so much is that they're very complex. There are many lenses inside because you're trying to use the aberration caused by one lens to cancel out the aberration produced by a different lens. And this is a really complicated bit of engineering. We'll just look at two lens systems. The simplest one, we imagine a telescope like Galileo had, where we have two converging lenses, one large and one small. This will give us a refracting telescope. If you remember when we first talked about parallel light, we wanted to know how far away is far enough to give us parallel light. What really sets the scale is the focal length of our lenses. If our object distance is very far compared to the focal length, we can say it's essentially infinite and the light is parallel. Anything we look at with the telescope will satisfy this. The moon is the closest thing we can see, and it's 400,000 kilometers away, and that's ridiculously larger than the focal length of any of our telescopes. That means we consider we have parallel light coming through the larger lens, the objective, and that means it will come to a point one objective focal length away. We also want to get parallel light out of the smaller lens, which we call the eyepiece, because that's what's most comfortable for your eye to see. That's what you're walking around in outside. To get parallel light out of an eyepiece, we need to stay one focal length away from the source. The telescope is therefore going to have a length pretty close to the sum of the focal lengths of the two lenses. We can approximate the magnification by looking at the ratio of the focal lengths. This shows that if we want lar larger magnification, we need either a larger focal length of the objective. This generally means larger diameter, which always means larger, larger cost, or a smaller focal length for the eyepiece. This looks like the way to go. It's a smaller lens. It's cheaper. The problem is you don't really, if the eyepiece focal length is very small and its diameter is small, you're going to run into diffraction effects, which we'll learn about soon. And manufacturers who are trying to cheat you will sometimes use this on the outside of the telescope box to make it look like there's a very high magnification telescope inside. And what they're doing is just using this formula and giving you this very short focal length, almost unusable eyepiece. As a final example, let's say we have a two lens system made of a converging lens with a focal length of 0.27 meters and a diverging lens with a focal length of negative 0.9 meters and we put the two lenses 0.5 meters apart. If the object is 0.4 meters to the left of the converging lens, where's the final image? First, we use the thin lens equation to find the position of the image that the first lens forms. This is just like we've been doing. We do the math and we get 0.831 meters. However, that places it over here to the right of the diverging lens. Our image distance is real over here but it's on the opposite side of this lens from the object. It's so far to the right that it's to the right of the diverging lens. This is the case where our object distance for this lens will actually be negative. It would be negative 0.331 meters. Now we use the thin lens equation again. We put in our negative focal length for the lens, our negative object distance, and we get 0.524 meters. So our final image, this is incorrect, our final image is 0.524 meters to the right of the diverging lens. To find the magnification, we plug in the individual magnifications and take their product. 
and we end up with negative 3.29, which tells us the final image is inverted and larger than the object.